any dearth of regulatory laws or any law in our country. That it's just that uh, who supervises, you know, I mean, who guards the guards? Uh, we briefly toyed with the idea of FRDI. What was that bill? Uh, yes, FRDI bill. I mean, it was such a badly drafted bill. There was, I mean, widespread panic among the people. And after all, you know, we have to be mindful of the political fallout. People thought that their money was being taken away to proper banks. So we'll now open up to questions. Uh, but please keep your questions brief to the point. If you have any additional points or views to make, we are meeting for tea after this. You can share them with uh, Professor Subramanian and Professor Patnaik. So who wants to go first? Yeah, Vishnu. Good evening. My name uh, is... If, if we could all introduce ourselves formally. My name is Vishnu Prakash. I am the former ambassador of India to Canada and South Korea, amongst other things. Permit me to be a little provocative. Uh, and I'm playing the devil's advocate. Uh, you know, to me, listening, and I'm a student of economics, but uh, not ex exactly uh, an expert in the area where both of you are. Listening to both of you and what I've been, the general narrative is that it's as if with hindsight vision is 2020, and we are just looking back and trying to say this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong. Whereas there were, uh, there are, uh, there were experts uh, in the in your office, uh, led by you and others. Were were red flags raised on issues that we are talking about now? You mentioned that there were self-inflicted wounds. So, uh, where could the government have done it differently? And. Um, Was GST, introduction of GST, a major disruptor? Because many people believe that uh, it, it did cause a shock, and uh, especially the SME sector was badly affected. Others were badly affected. And lastly, uh, is there a perception problem also? Have we lost the narrative? Is it, because when there is a negative perception, it becomes a self-fulfilling -ful prophecy and rather kind of becomes leads to a negative cycle. So is, are we seeing that? So shall we take a couple of questions? Yeah. Yes, Abhijit, briefly. Yeah, yeah, I'll be as brief as possible. Because, you know, I am happy that uh, the entire phone banking thing has been brought up by Professor Ila Patnaik. But then uh, my question is related to that. But my point is that, as you correctly pointed out, that there has been a uh, you know the facts. Facts are very clear. One one is that the public sector banks they provide more credit to let's say industry. You know even if we look at the, the simple ratio of the debt portfolio also. So then obviously you know that is one one factor. And uh, so that means the private sector banks they don't extend credit to the industry as much as public sector banks. Secondly, even if there are you know. I think, you know, even if the pri uh, public sector banks are pri uh, privatized or whatever, I'm all for giving more licenses. I'm all for on-the-shoulder kind of regulation. There is no doubt about it. But then the, my point is that, that why it actually never happened that the credit delivery system or the credit channel has been driven by the pub uh, private sector banks. If not a major way, even if we look at the growth rates in the credit, if there also I don't, at least, you know, correct me if I am wrong, you know, that is that is one part of it. Secondly, now forgotten and out of fashion, that entire Keynesian liquidity trap, you know, that logic is also there. Even if I combine all these things, then I really don't see, at least in the short run, a very strong case for public sector bank, uh, you know, privatization. So, you know, your reaction to that. Secondly, now, it's a corollary to this first question is that, Whenever the public sector banks are dipped down into the NPAs and other kind of things, now we are seeing that, you know, the organizations like LIC and those kind of, you know, big, uh, you know, different kind of non-bank 
but public sector organizations are approached for this entire thing. How do I know that, you know, this is not going to happen? Even if the problem was that the NBFC actually was touted as the, you know, the alternative to this, alternative to this entire public sector driven banking system. But the right now we are in a situation where actually, you know, the if the NBFCs fail, then obviously the owners, you know, the final owners will once again come back to the public sector banks. So that's what we are we are actually dealing with. I'm not getting into the fiscal this thing. Okay. That, that uh, second question, the, the, the bad but bank. No, no, we'll begin. We'll start yeah. with this one, yeah. then we'll move on to okay. another question. Anybody else, please? Yes, ma'am. Then I will hand over the mic to Professor Subramanian. Yes, ma'am. And if if I leave out some questions, please uh, uh, you know catch me and and don't don't spare me. Um, uh, I I don't want to give give the impression that I'm not not responding to some questions. Um, let let me begin with this whole you know narrative versus perception thing, right? See, I, I am a pretty kind of simple-minded person. I I think and I believe in kind of fundamentals. Uh, that you know if this. It's fundamentals that should finally, should and probably do drive perception. There may be, you know, episodes here and there where, you know, one gets ahead of the other, the perception gets ahead of the reality, or the reality gets ahead of the perception. But uh, I think, you know, fundamentally in the long run, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the fundamentals that prevail uh, and should prevail. So I think we should therefore focus more on the fundamentals then start worrying about perception. It's true that, you know, Keynes said animal spirits matter uh, and, and all of these things matter. Uh, but the point is that you can't do very much. So if you only change, if you only focus on the perception without changing uh, the underlying realities, you're not going, probably not, not even going to affect the perception game. So I'm a strong believer in, you know, and I may be naive and, and kind of uh, almost simple minded on this, but I really think we should focus on, on the fundamentals and, you know, let others kind of worry about uh, the perception. Um, on, on, on GST, and I suppose you probably had demonetization in mind as well, how much of a disruption did that cost, uh, uh, um, did that lead to? See, I, th I think there is no doubt in my mind that um, there were some significant short-term costs to both demonetization and GST. Um, For me, the puzzle, especially with demonetization, there are two kind of puzzles for me. Um, one is that even if you look at all the research that's done by Gita Gopinath of the IMF, is that 
you know, uh, I think everyone would admit there were large costs to the economy, especially for the informal sector, uh, you know, when, when demonetization and, of course, later GST were implemented. Uh, but this research by Gita and others showed that, you know, those costs to the formal economy, at least, were pretty shallow and pretty short-lived. Uh, and so I'm still trying to, you know, uh, you know, come, trying to come to grips with, uh, you know, uh, those kind of statements. I think maybe maybe both were true. I, I, I think what, to me, what has certainly been a surprise is relative to the scale of, you know, how much cash was reduced, and relative to what all of us kind of expected about what that cash reduction should do to the formal sector, uh, I think you know uh, the impact was probably a, a little bit less than what we what we expected. Um, however, I think we should should be. I mean, uh, Harish Damodaran uh, is, makes this point to me very often that maybe there were also some permanent effects of demonetization and GST, in the, especially demonetization in the sense that um, you know. Uh, you know, think of both of these things as, you know, changing the terms of doing business for the informal sector. It is going to be disruptive in the short term, right? Uh, the question is, you know, do are there compensating gains in the long run, uh, uh, from especially from from the GST? Uh, I, I think you know the GST could clearly the implementation could have been uh, better. The, uh, certainly, the rate structure could have been much more simple, as as I had advocated in my report. Um, uh, but I do think that you know these things should not have too many permanent impacts, and I think that uh, uh, that's where I think so. There were short term impacts, but you know. Uh, I, I think my, my prior certainly is that we shouldn't expect any permanent impacts from this. And what I've been surprised by this work is that in the case of demonetization, how actually it contributed to a bit of a credit boom in, in the middle, that was for me a, a bit of a surprise. Um, now, on the question, I, I'm going to uh, 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 ask Ila to answer. She's much more competent to answer the questions on the public sector credit and LIC. Also, I think it's a very good question. I mean, is it, you know, are we, uh, you know, extending the problem from the public sector banks to the LIC that I think um, um, tr transmission mechanism, I, I, I think that the transmission mechanism is not working precisely because of the problems in the financial sector. You know, uh, if you cut uh, the repo rate, banks don't want to take advantage and lend more because they think that, you know, what are the opportunities? Uh, you know, uh, uh, they don't want to because they themselves have so many NPAs, they want to build up their profit margins. So I think uh, the transmission mechanism, again, cannot be improved by, you know, instructions from the RBI. You cannot change that by fiat. You have to fix the fundamentals which is in the financial system, and then the transmission mechanism will also work. Of final question on the $5 trillion. You see, I think at some level, I think aspirations are good to have, ambitious aspirations are, are good to have. Um, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, the aspiration has to be translated into, into action to, 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 to realize those aspirations. Um, and, you know, um, certainly, I, I, I think uh, Ila is spot on in terms of saying, you know, what we need to do kind of uh, on, on a long run permanent basis to fix the financial system. You know, uh, she, she's 100% right on that. F this paper focuses more on, you know, what we need to do, you know, in the short run to get out of you know, the current slowdown and also to address some of the problems that, that we have. And ELAS is a kind of complementary view of you know, what more to make sure that these problems don't recur uh, in the future. Now, um, I think, A, there are no magic bullets. I think you know, we, we, we all know that. Um, but I do think that you know, uh, uh, fixing uh, the problems in the finance system, the power in real estate, and also, I think we have some ideas on how to fix the IBC, uh, I, I think, are, are, are very important. Uh, I think if we could do more on agriculture, I think that would be, uh, and we have some ideas on that. But I also think, you know, in some ways, um, just as Ila said that, you know, a, a country like India should have the best financial system, right? I think we should, we were, you know, uh, unlike in the case of finance, Ila, you know, 
we never had one of the world's best financial systems. In the case of data, we did have some of the best uh, data systems. You know, Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winner, has always said how you know we were a kind of model for many of these things. Uh, I, I think you know it, it may not you know change the world, but at some fundamental level, if we don't have you know, the basic reliable data to answer all the policy questions. I think, you know, you can't really ha make sustained progress. So that's why I think these five areas that we spelt out, um, you know, we just spelt out ideas on, again, on how to fix the immediate problem. I think there is a longer term thing analogous to what Ila said about the financial system is how do we improve the data systems on a more permanent basis? You know, are they understaffed? Do they need more resources? Do we need more expertise? I mean, do we need a, a culture that, again, values good data more? All these are kind of, I think, important questions. Uh, I think she also wanted to know what are the three solutions you would recommend? Yeah, so I... I, I so, yeah. Okay, we'll cut it, pair it down to three. Like, if, if the finance minister were to call you right now and say that, look, I'm going into a meeting where I need to uh, put up three, prob uh, three problem busters. So what are those one, two, three? Quickly tell me. No, I, I think we, we had that. I mean, I would say, you know, uh, a big bang, you know, f all data areas we... You know, think of you know, think of the confidence that would come back if you know we say you know we're going to have you know commitment to the world's best data systems. You know that would be uh, that may not get you you know you know growth in the short run, but I think it's been, I think the financial system would be my first first uh, port of call. You know, bad banks in this and you know IBC do the AQR uh, for for uh, uh, the, the NBFCs and things starting with that, and I think also simultaneously you know. You know, set in process a motion that we could get to the kind of permanent improvements in the financial system that uh, that Ila has been talking about, and then I would focus a lot on agriculture. But, oh, by the way, remember, uh, uh, in any list, as I say, you should also have what you shouldn't do, and, and in, in addition to what you should do, and you know, I would not do uh, uh, more uh, uh, fiscal expansion because we don't have that. Uh, I, I would not cut personal individual income tax rates. Uh, I, I would not raise GST rates. All of those things. But I think you know. Uh, Going on mission mode on raising agricultural productivity growth, uh, I, I think is something that I would embark upon. And there, I think there's a there's an see there's a there's an insight due to Mr. Arun Jaitley that you know I'm very uh, uh, partial to, which is that you know we can say what needs to be done, you know, and you know again as Ila said, you know all these things there's nothing, no one is reinventing any wheel. We all know what needs to be done. In the case of agriculture, I think the only thing on, on the mechanism, modalities, I would say is that because I think um, many of these things in power, in uh, agriculture, are both within the purview of the center and the states, I think the cooperative federalism framework that we used for the GST, I think we should do much more uh, in other areas, including power and agriculture. Uh, I, I think that's a kind of, you know, how you do reform, uh, I think that's as important as the what you do reform. Let me start with the transmission mechanism. Now, there is a short run issue and a long run issue. And the short run issue seems to be that uh, in the period after demonetization, we've really been in a tight liquidity situation. That's what the bankers keep complaining about. And that effectively the RBI has been not just lending at the uh, repo rate. So the reverse repo rate has pretty much been moved up. So they are willing to borrow at the reverse repo rate. The, it is a tight liquidity situation, in short. So that's the very, very short term answer. I mean, like you can uh, change those things in a, a few weeks. But I think the longer term answer is that you need a competitive market. You need. Banks who want to go out and lend, not banks who are being forced to lend, but banks who want to do the business of banking. Unless you have banks who want to do the business of banking, you don't get a banking sector. Today, we don't fully understand what contributes to the problem, how much of it is because of the three Cs, how much of it is because there's four, no... Four, four. four Cs? Courts, CBI, and CH. 
Okay. Okay. The four C's. So we, we don't fully understand why public sector banks don't want to do banking. But once you do understand that they don't want to do banking, then you want to bring people who do want to do banking. And so if you know the rates are cut, what does transmission require? That people want to borrow at that rate and lend to businesses who want to borrow. If they don't want to do it, you're not going to get a transmission mechanism at all. Also, you need bond markets. You know, you, what you have is a government bond market, which is pretty much with the RBI, where the RBI decides, OK, I'll intervene at the two-year rate, at the five-year rate, at the 10-year rate. You, you know, they, it is not a deep and liquid bond market. You have a segmented market. You have a corporate bond market, which has a different infra market infrastructure, where the exchange is different, where the clearing corporation is different, where the depository is different. You have government bond market, market having a SGL as its depository. You have the corporate bond market with NSDL. This is the only country in the world, only bond market which is segmented into two. And where we think that it will still be deep and liquid, and both segments will become deep and liquid, and we are not willing to merge them. We don't have a debt manager other than the banking regulator. So it has a whole host of problems why transmission is a problem. And even though, yes, as I said, we can do a bit more of easy liquidity and try it. While we are cutting rates, liquidity should be easy. When you are raising rates, liquidity should be tight, because that's what you're wanting to transmit. If you do the opposite, that while you are cutting rate, you keep liquidity tight, then you're not going to get the transmission. So that's to answer that question. Now I want to talk about the $5 trillion. You know, we are not a we are not a planned economy anymore. So people who say target of five, target of six, target of eight, we, we're not about targets. I, I think $5 trillion is an aspiration. $5 trillion is the PM saying, look, we want to do things to push up growth rate. I think the last government focused a lot on welfare measures, which were their uh, political philosophy of trying to do more Garib Kalyan, more reaching out to, we had, a lot of things which directly reached to the poor, from cooking gas to housing to toilets to many, many things. But the emphasis was not on growth. And the five trillion is an aspiration that we want higher growth. I mean, everybody can see we're not going to get to five trillion. OK, it's, it's, I mean, it's, and it's not something to joke about. It's, it, we are in a deep crisis. We are in a contracting economy. So normally, a recession in an emerging economy is not contraction. Normally, in emerging economies, a recession is a mere slowdown. It's a cycle around a trend. It is not actual contraction of the economy. Today, unfortunately, as many of Arvind's uh, indicators showed you, we get GDP showing positive because a lot of GDP is service economy. A large part of it is government sector. And you know the salaries that we are getting constitute part of it. And they can't contract, really. But what you see in many of the indicators that Arvind showed, and which are also being seen by you know, our teams when we look at uh, the coincident indicator and leading indicators for the economy, the act, there are many sectors like IR industrial production. There are many sectors which are showing signs of actual contraction, which is uh, th this is the fourth episode that that has happened in India. 72, 73 in the oil crisis and uh, two successive droughts in 79 with the oil crisis and drou drought. And uh, uh, in 1992, when you had this major, uh, um, ma major macroeconomic crisis for a very short period, and now. So you, we've had slowdowns. We've had cycles around a trend. We've not had an actual contraction. So we are in a very difficult position. I think still getting up and saying $5 trillion is a brave thing to do. And it is saying that we are still committed to higher growth. So let's, let's, let's just treat it as that and not try to you know, come up with whether, not try to mock it, let me, let me say. It's not something to be mocked. Where we are today is a very, very serious uh, situation. Uh, the third uh, uh, thing was about uh, demonetization. Now, I was one of the big critics of demonetization, that it's not going to achieve what it achieved. However, I have also been surprised, like Arvind has, at how it did not have a bigger impact. You know, when we look at the impact, the impact seems to be more short term and more contained. 
Now, I'm, I'm not sure I have a full explanation for why it happened, because you know, as a macroeconomist and a monetary economist, if, I, if you tell me I'm going to take away 86% of cash in circulation, I would expect that the impact is much more. There are many explanations that one could try to come up with. You know, money moved to the formal sector, money moved to banks. I mean, the credit boom you talked about was because all the money came back to banks. And suddenly they had, a, they had what, roughly 17 lakh crores more than they had previously. And so then they lent it out. And perhaps they lent a lot more of it out to NBFCs, who then lent it to real estate rather than it going to real estate directly. So you know, the way the economy functioned changed because we did something which was disruptive. From there, I would say even the GST was disruptive. <laughs> the other day at uh, Dr. Kelkar's um, book launch, uh, Mr. N.K. Singh said that the GST council has changed GST rates by 38 times in the last two and a half years. 38 times in the last two and a half years gives people policy uncertainty. They don't know what's coming. And it's not as if, Fortunately, they didn't change it now. They just change it on lotteries at 28%. But you know, the fear that they'll keep on changing rates is there. It's first, of, co of course, there are difficulties with com compliance. There are administrative issues. People find it hard to comply. But then there's also policy uncertainty that it has induced. Maybe we could have a you know, go back to the Arvind Subramanian report that this you need a now that we've tried GST with multiple rates, with high rates, maybe Arvind was right after all, that we go back to that and say that you do need a simple single rate. And it's time to think about that and then to promise that within two years, within three years, within five years, within however much time the government thinks is a reasonable amount of time, could be within two quarters, we will come to a stable rate and then we'll stop changing the rates. So, can we do that exercise? Because without that, it creates a lot of policy uncertainty. Uh, you had a question. I think the last question that we have is on uh, public sector banks and is it time to privatize? So I did, I've stopped talking about privatization of public sector banks. I think Arvind was asked to, so he said, <laughs> yes, they should. But I think most of us know that they're not going to get privatized, right? So why discuss? Let's talk about, can we give more bank licenses? You know, the telecom model and the airline model was not to privatize Air India. It's still not privatized. But today, a lot of us have access to uh, air, you know, fl flights, because air travel, because you allowed more licenses. You set up a regulator, which did a you know, fairly decent job of now making it accessible to people. Similarly, you know, all of our, the accessibility to uh, telephony went up hugely after telecom was opened up to private operators. So that is the alternative to when you have these holy cows who can't be touched. At least we stop putting money into them. At least we stop shifting their risk to LIC, which is also scary when they, you know, when LIC acquires risk that was held by them. And don't make LIC buy, what did, yeah, IDPI, which, 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 yeah. which yeah, yeah. So, the, so the, you, you're absolutely right about that. So I think that's the way we can uh, combine the politics and the economics, and that's the way we could possibly go. Um, this has been a very interesting and very informative discussion, and we, there are several key takeaways we leave with. On just a point, I mean, just an observation. Stuff happens, we forget that UTI also went down by putting money into the wrong place. 